the idea for the book uh, came along from already in 2014 when I was still living in Qatar, uh, when I saw the first, witnessed the first crisis, the first Gulf crisis, or I shouldn't say the first one, but the previous Gulf crisis, uh, when also Qatar was not embargoed, but they were at least there was a, a diplomatic rift with its neighbors. And what I saw at that time is that most people are talking about a clash over interest and a clash over, uh, 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 over um, yeah, mostly over interest. When in reality, I realized this is a clash which goes runs a lot deeper. If you have a, if you have a, if you have a crisis, if you have a conflict of interest, then you can usually find common ground and you know overlaps of of interest, and then try to build around that, build some um, some consensus. The problem with this crisis is, and that that crisis doesn't go back to 2014, as Christian will uh, s s tell you later. I mean, this is a crisis that runs goes back probably to the 19th century, if you will. Um, but it's definitely it's a crisis for me. That is an ideological one. It's one over values, and it's um, uh, rather than interest. It's one, uh, and that makes it even more difficult to actually resolve it. Because if you have a crisis over values and ontology, basically about how you view the world, these are two different, very very strong world views that are clashing here, and they have been clashing, particularly since the Arab Spring. But not only, but the Arab Spring has been a, the transformational impact on. Uh, on the Arab world and on the Gulf. So during the Arab Spring, we saw the old powerhouses completely disintegrating. So Cairo, uh, Damascus, Baghdad has already been kind of uh, destroyed in 2003. And we see this shift of power away from, from the Levant and North Africa to the Gulf. And in the Gulf, we have countries that you know are very young for the most part, never had a fully developed process of foreign policy and never had to really take over responsibility and were suddenly in the driver's seat were very financially very well endowed and thought they could now, they had now the responsibility, but also the ability to use that financial wealth to kind of reshape the Arab world. And so the, on, the, the only center of stability then was really used to be Saudi, Qatar and the UAE. And it's probably to a degree even today in the Arab world, relatively, especially Abu Dhabi and Doha are the two centers of, of stability in, in the Arab world. These two centers, and that is where, where this book is, where I centered on is that it's to understand the rift that is going through the Gulf, but also more widely going through the Arab world since the Arab Spring is a rift over ontology and ideology that is that that is polarized around the poles of Abu Dhabi and Doha. I'm, and I'm saying Abu Dhabi because I'm not saying the UAE. The UAE's foreign policy and its wider policies are dominated by Abu Dhabi, whereby Dubai is taking very much a backseat in most of their foreign policy decisions to its own detriment because they have no choice. Now, so what is the ideology? What are this? What are these two ideological and worldviews all about? So in Qatar, really, we need to understand both of these countries, UAE and Qatar, were trying to emancipate themselves from Saudi, uh, from the Saudi wider Saudi uh, um, umbrella in the in the 1990s. And we have two individuals coming to power almost at the same time. You've got Hamad bin Khalifa, the old Emir in Qatar, coming to power in the early 1990s. He wasn't. He only became Emir in 1995, but already beforehand had quite a lot of influence, influence over the policymaking process. And on the, on the other side of that, of, of, uh, um, of that, of the ocean, if you will, of that Gulf of Abu Dhabi, um, you had uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, the, the leader and the son of the, the then ruler of the UAE, him raising through the ranks of the military and he himself making himself, making a massive, having a massive impact on how the country would be run. And these two individuals had two different visions. On the one, Hamad bin Khalifa, the father of Mira Qatar, um, having the idea that he could reshape the Arab world by removing authoritarianism. He thought that if his country was going to advance, it needed to advance through more civil liberties. And what, he always spoke about democracy, but it wasn't really about democracy. It was more about pluralism and a liberal idea of education, freedom of speech, and so on. And that was something he thought you could export to the Arab world, Al Jazeera being a, a very good example of that. Um, on the other side of, uh, um, uh, in Abu Dhabi, Ahmad bin Khalifa, uh, sorry, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed was someone who rank, who rose through the, the military ranks and he was very much a, an individual who was militaristic in his viewpoint. He believed in strong states. And you know, him, the old image of little Sparta means that Abu Dhabi would develop or the UAE would develop increasingly into a, a military, a, a strong state where there was no room for pluralism. And when the Arab Spring happened, these two ideologies could now be, were now being exported. First from the countries, the countries were the most activist country during the Arab Spring. 
And they were basically exporting this idea of pluralism, engaging the people that would go to the streets. Clearly, the Qataris didn't have a good strategy behind it because they thought, you know, if people go to the streets, all we need to give them is, is basically the cover of Al Jazeera, uh, empower them where we can, and they will build a new social political reality after these authoritarian countries disintegrate. Obviously, that was not how it played out. You know, it, we, we, we kind of saw these countries disintegrating and then very little coming afterwards. The UAE saw what the countries were doing and said, this is not how we want the Arab world to look like. The Emiratis were saying, if you give the people pluralism in the Arab world, you will end up with terrorism, you'll end up with civil societal activism that will e eventually be hijacked by the Islamists and the Al-Qaeda-esque ISIS, Daesh type of people, and that will lead to chaos and terrorism. And these two narratives, one of pluralism and one of what the, what the, what the Emiratis would call authoritarian stability, and I think this narrative is something that the Emiratis have been implanted quite successfully in conservative circles in this country, uh, but also in Europe. And um, much of their information networks that the Emiratis have built uh, over, over the last 10 years, um, particularly since the Arab Spring, um, are, are looking to advance that idea of saying we are a country that is supporting counterterrorism. We are we're helping you to fight terrorism, which is something that resonates very well with people on the Hill, people in the White House. Because, of course, we, we want to fight terrorism. It's the problem of that narrative is that the way they frame terrorism, it's not just political Islam more widely, which takes, I would say, 25 to 30 percent of most Arabs subscribe to one form of political Islam. So mm -hmm. if you want a, a stable future in the Arab world, you need a, an, an Arab world that endorses uh, political Islam or at least allows political Islam to be part of the political process by sidelining them, by imprisoning them you are basically uh, creating a dictatorship type authoritarian countries um, that are unstable. And um, the problem with that is that more widely the UAE, what they've tried to do is basically frame any civil societal group that is anti-status quo in the Arab world as a terrorist organization. If you look at the list that the Emiratis have basically given to Congress and have given to the White House, to the Obama administration already, have given to us in, in the UK, it's a list of, I think, 95 different organizations that they consider to be terrorist organizations. Many of them are completely legitimate uh, uh, civil societal groups in this country and in, in the UK. Uh, and basically what they're trying to say is that anyone who is trying to usurp the authoritarian regimes or undermine the authoritarian regimes in the region are basically terrorist organizations. And that clash, that divide over pluralism, which is the countries were very active in promoting until 2014, more recently, they've taken a step back and said, look, uh, we made some mistakes in Syria, we made some mistakes in Libya, but we're still trying to advance that particular narrative via Al Jazeera and soft power. Um, and th on the other hand, though, the Emiratis have become very activist. And what they have done um, is we can see that divide in, in, in Libya, we can see it in Algeria, we can see it in Sudan, we can see it in Egypt, where the Emiratis are basically supporting groups that are very much on the authoritarian end of the social political spectrum um, and are very tough on not just terrorism, but tough on civil society more widely. What more, uh, what, uh, what Sisi has done in Egypt is create an authoritarian state that is second to none in e Egyptian history. I think the kind of repression that we see in Egypt right now under the uh, patronage of the Emiratis has created a, a, a regime that is worse than the Mubarak regime ever was in terms of how they deal with civil society, how they clamp down on the freedom of speech. And something similar, and, and this is also something that leads us to Libya, because that's something that is very much on the priority list at the moment, um, that in Libya right now, we have the same thing happening. We have uh, you know, support for an, an authoritarian such as Haftar, who is trying to basically undermine the legitimate UN inclusive pluralistic process to <clears throat> build his own uh, authoritarian regime. And I think this is where the problem lies. And my chapter on the weaponization of narratives is basically looking at how these narratives have been exported and how particularly the Emirates, because the countries, as I said, have become less and less activists, but how particularly the Emirates are exporting that narrative in Europe in neoconservative and conservative circles. And, we, you know, this is not just the Republican Party in this country. Um, uh, it is also a lot of conservatives in, in the UK, conservatives in Germany, uh, in, in Brussels, in particular members of the European Parliament, who kind of being confronted with the complexity of the Arab world, are being confronted with a very simplistic narrative of saying, do you want stability or do you want terrorism? And everybody would say, I'm, I'm going for stability. And they say, if you want stability, you go with us. We'll make sure that none of these NGOs, none of these civil societal groups in the region will have any say in, 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 in social politics.
And you know, it's a simplistic narrative, but it's one that that, that resonates quite well. And and this is what this uh, initially this idea was about. And there are obviously a lot of other components that kind of drove this crisis. But I think at the heart of it, it's an ideological one. And then there are all kinds of other elements that we describe or that all these uh, different contributors nicely outline and analyze in this book in the other 13 chapters. And I'll leave it at that and uh, give the word to uh, to Giorgio to maybe tell us a little bit about uh, what the Trump administration uh, or, uh, and their role was in, in kind of facilitating mm -hmm. this divide. Andreas, thank you so much. <coughs> I also want to thank Gulf International Forum for this chance to talk about uh, the book. Um, as Andreas mentioned, I wrote the book with, uh, sorry, I wrote the chapter in the book that looked at the variable of the Trump administration and how the election of Donald Trump in 2016 uh, factored into the picture. Um, I think it's important to go back to the 2014 crisis or maybe more of a, a diplomatic spat um, and start there. Of course, that took place when the Obama administration was in power and the Obama administration understood that this rift, mainly between Doha on one side and Abu Dhabi on the other, was a big threat to U.S. interests. And even though on paper the 2014 spat ended in November of that year, there was no doubt that the root causes of this division were still there and there was... Um, the risk of sounding too extreme, I would really use the word hatred between uh, people on both sides of this rift. And the Obama administration did quite a bit to try to make sure that the GCC would remain relatively united and that the events of June 2017, which they were concerned would happen, they worked hard to put pressure on the parties to prevent exactly that kind of outcome. There's this question, if Obama had a third term or had Hillary Clinton won the 2016 election, would the blockade of Qatar have happened? We'll never know the answer to that, but I would argue that you can make the case that the blockade would not have happened had Obama had a third term or had Hillary Clinton uh, been elected. I think from Abu Dhabi's perspective and also the perspective of Riyadh, Cairo too, there were grievances with the Qatari foreign policy that Andreas outlined a few minutes ago, which were very serious. And they were just below the surface. And the Emiratis still believed that action needed to be taken against Qatar. The belief was that what happened in 2014 was not enough. This was just simply recalling the ambassadors and issuing some rhetoric about uh, Qatar's support for terrorism and extremism but it didn't ultimately achieve their objectives. And I would argue the objective was to make Qatar uh, function in a way that is more or less the way that Bahrain operates in the GCC now. A country that, yes, it is officially independent. It has its own seat at the UN. On paper, it's an independent country, but in practice, it operates as basically a puppet state of Saudi Arabia. The objective was to bring the Arabian Peninsula's geopolitical order back to the pre-1995 era when Qatar was not asserting its independence and its autonomy. The view was that the Trump administration and the Trump presidency provided a very unique and probably the only opportunity for the blockading countries to achieve the goals that they were not able to achieve in 2014 understanding was that the president was unaware of the complexities of the Gulf region. The president and the people around him were inexperienced and that the president was very much focused on domestic interests while lacking a sophisticated understanding of the Middle East. And the belief was that when Trump came to Riyadh for his historic speech in May 2017, he addressed leaders of many Arab and Muslim countries and said, this is the time when the U.S. The allies in the Middle East get serious about fighting terrorism. This was a unique opportunity to sell the case against Qatar and to say, look, we are serious about going after terrorism. The evidence that we're going after terrorism is this blockade that we're imposing on Qatar. The message was that today we get serious about dealing with extremism, and this is the first step 
Trump, of course, immediately put out his impulsive tweets in which he bragged about going to Riyadh and giving a speech that resulted in this blockade. He went as far as saying that this blockade marked the beginning of the end of terrorism in the Middle East. I think clearly Trump wanted to be able to return from Saudi Arabia and send a message to American voters that he was able to really achieve something and that this was a tangible result of his historic visit to Riyadh. Of course, what we saw later was that the American uh, establishment, the diplomatic establishment, the defense establishment was not on the same page as the uh, president was initially. It was made very clear by Rex Tillerson, made very clear by the Pentagon, that Qatar is still indeed an important US ally. There's a huge American military presence in the Emirate and that this alliance is not going to change, notwithstanding the uh, surprising tweets that came from Donald Trump shortly after the blockade went into effect. And I think a real mistake on the part of Abu Dhabi and Riyadh was that they didn't fully appreciate the extent to which US foreign policy is shaped not only by an individual sitting in the White House, but also institutions here in this city. And that even if they had a president who had rhetoric suggesting that he was very anti-Muslim Brotherhood, that he was also against political Islam, and that he brought people into his administration who had a record of speaking about the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. This was still, it was a mistake to think that these facts would lead to the US totally aligning against Qatar as Abu Dhabi and Riyadh had wished. Nonetheless, I think the damage was done though their perceptions of Trump gave them the confidence and emboldened them to the point where they thought that they could impose this blockade on Qatar, issue these 13 demands, which if the Qataris were to ever meet, would be a humiliating surrender of sovereignty. But they believed that this could work and that the US government would fully back the blockade of Qatar. We obviously know over two years later, the U.S. still considers Qatar to be a very close ally. And even, I think, on, only a month after the um, tweets went out, there was the, the counterterrorism agreement that Washington and Doha signed. But nonetheless, as I said, I think the real damage to GCC unity was done. It was the nature of the Trump presidency that gave the blockading countries the confidence to take this action these are actions that seriously have uh, major consequences that can't just be reversed immediately. Look at the future of the GCC. I don't see reconciliation on the horizon. As I said a few moments ago, from the Qatari perspective, to um, meet these demands would amount to giving up sovereignty. And no nation state in the world would do that if they had any other option. Likewise, from Abu Dhabi and Riyadh's vantage point, to lift or ease the blockade without Qatar changing any of its policies would demonstrate real weakness at a time when Mohammed bin Zayed and Mohammed bin Salman are trying to assert themselves as leaders in the region. So put simply, the costs of surrender, costs of capitulation outweigh the perceived benefits of uh, reconciliation. The US is definitely paying a big price for the GCC being what I would call a dormant institution right now. I think, I don't think we can call it a dead institution, but again, it's certainly a, a dormant institution. And the US is not able to unite its Gulf Arab allies against Iran at a time when the White House wants to do that. Quite simply, Qatar sees a much bigger threat from Saudi Arabia and the UAE from Iran. It's not to say that Doha and Tehran are on the same page where there's some affinity that Qataris have for Iranians. And of course, disagreements over Syria showcase the extent to which Qatar and Iran still disagree with each other on major issues in the region. But because of the Iranian airspace, and because of Iranian ports, Qatar was able to avoid a major food security crisis. And Qatar's ability to uh, weather the blockade is in no small part attributable to Iran's help during the crisis. So this idea that Qatar is going to join a Saudi or UAE or Trump-led anti-Iranian coalition is completely 
divorced from the reality on the ground in uh, the region right now. Obviously, uh, Trump is not going to be able to unify the GCC countries against Iran. And again, I will just end here by making the point that this problem of not being able to unify GCC states against Iran is in no small part a problem of the administration's own making. Well, thank you for setting that up so nicely. And I would agree with you 100% that the blockade's timing is absolutely to do with the administration taking office. And if you remember, Ben Rhodes gave an interview in January 2018 in which he said that much of what has happened since 2017 with the Gulf, and he mentioned Qatar specifically, has been things that we as an administration try to prevent from happening. You got the impression that in 2014, for example, the 2014 iteration of this vow that the Obama administration was very active in actually leveraging its partners in the region to make sure it didn't go any further. Now, of course, when Trump came in, not only was that leverage removed, or at least the desire to use it was removed, but as you say, there was a feeling, I think, in Riyadh and in Abu Dhabi that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. The set of circumstances may never happen again, where you have an administration coming in with almost no prior policy position and a, a seeming lack of interest in settled U.S. positions and interests in well, across the world in some some respects. And that you know, I mean, for me, the one conundrum is you know, why did they think that just because the White House switched, the whole U.S. government would follow suit? And I mean, that obviously was the biggest miscalculation, and we're seeing that continue to play out. And I can only imagine that possibly the Trump administration and White House believe that too. And if you look back at some of the policies of the first few months in office, those chaotic first few months, it was as if the administration came in thinking we're going to do things our way. The normal rules of politics have been suspended. And of course, they haven't been. And we've seen with all the investigations and all the pushback, the institutional pushback we've seen, that we've seen and, and that, of course, has included the Gulf crisis, we've seen that... Uh, Institutions so far have, have not bended. I mean, they've been stressed, but they haven't been completely blown away. So I would agree with everything you said. I mean, we, as you said, we, lift, we live with the consequences of this rift. And I think for the GCC or for Gulf politics going forward, which is some of the stuff I looked at in the chapter, they are pretty grave. Uh, the rift has targeted Gulf politics and the GCC at its weakest points. The GCC has always been an uneasy collection of six states, one very large state, five much smaller ones. The Saudi heavy, top heavy Saudi nature of the GCC has always been a flashpoint, or at least a point of friction, not just for Qatar, for the UAE, for Kuwait, for Oman, less so for Bahrain for specific reasons. Saudi Arabia is seven times larger than the next biggest Gulf state, which is Oman. Oman itself is bigger than the other four Gulf states combined. So there's always been a power imbalance in terms of conventional power, in terms of territory, size, population, conventional power statistics. Now, clearly, Qatar and the UAE, as Andreas has made clear, have, have really boosted other forms of power, conventional in Abu Dhabi's case, and soft power and kind of smart power in Qatar's case. But, you know, the size imbalance remains. And there has always been, within the GCC, a concern that Saudi Arabia would start to throw its weight around. And if you look at the history of the GCC, on consistent occasions, that has prevented further integration of GCC countries. The concern that this would just facilitate or make possible a Saudi, an even more Saudi-led GCC. And what's interesting is, for example, in the 2000s, up until about 2010, the biggest uh, split in that nature was not between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, it was between Saudi Arabia and the UAE. I think. And there were many instances of the UAE and Saudi Arabia having pretty profound disagreements on the nature of closer union or the attempts of the smaller Gulf states to try to uh, bypass Saudi Arabia and work closely with each other. For example, in 2003, Qatar tried to build, or there were hopes to build a bridge between Qatar or a causeway between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar and Abu Dhabi, and the Saudis blocked it. The Saudis were tooth and nail against the construction of a pipeline from Saudi Arabia, from Qatar to the UAE as well. And they successfully blocked that pipeline from Qatar to Kuwait. Uh, 
Mm. So there's always been a degree of tension. Most obviously in 2009, when 20 years of planning for a Gulf single currency uh, went out of the window overnight after the central bank was awarded to Riyadh rather than to Abu Dhabi. And the Emiratis um, were very upset and frustrated by the decision and withdrew from the project two weeks later. So we've seen concern among all the Gulf states, the smaller ones, at the potential for a much more assertive, even aggressive Saudi Arabia that we now see under Mohammed bin Salman, joined at the hip in some ways by Mohammed bin Zayed in Abu Dhabi. So the, the consequences of what we've seen over the past two years of the attempt to impose what you might call a, a geopolitical straitjacket on Qatar, or perhaps by extension on some of the other Gulf states that don't necessarily share the Riyadh Abu Dhabi viewpoint on Gulf politics, especially towards Islamist groups, political Islam, whether it has a role in domestic political landscapes or outreach to Iran. This is hitting the GCC at its very weakest point and is being watched with profound concern in other capitals such as Kuwait City and in Oman, in Muscat. The, the 13 conditions which you spoke about, of course, there were only 12. The 13th was that it had to be accepted within 10 days or the, the points became invalid. And so I think it's been clear that the the, the 13th point has, has kind of been uh, uh, neglected. But the point of those conditions, as I think caused profound concern in the other capitals, because the, the, the way that these conditions were used against Qatar in 2017 does not, it's not specifically about Qatar itself. If you're going to use Iran against Qatar, well, Kuwait and Oman have political, pragmatic political relationships with Iran. Dubai has much more of an economic relationship with Iran than even Qatar has. So you're going to use this against them. It could be used against other countries as well. The Muslim Brotherhood in politics, well, <coughs> the Muslim Brotherhood has been a political actor in Kuwait and in Bahrain, and a respected and legitimate one for 20 to 25 years. So again, if you're going to use this against Qatar, it has clear implications for other Gulf states. These splits don't just run from Saudi Arabia to Doha. They, these are splits that cross the entire Gulf in different ways, and there's no simple black or white. And that's the problem, I think, that the Saudis, and to some extent, obviously their partners in Abu Dhabi, have tried to paint this, his, this kind of rift, this narrative. And it doesn't cut that way. It cuts across Gulf societies, it cuts across Gulf states. And that's why I think it's going to make any recoherence of the GCC or of Gulf politics much, much more difficult. Threat perceptions, which I wrote about in my chapter as well, as you said, if you're sitting in Doha, your threat perception is not from Iran, it's from Saudi Arabia, it's from Abu Dhabi. This is not the first time this has happened, as you said, it happened in 2014. Going further back, and of course, Ambassador Theros will remember it happened in 1996, when you had the same four countries, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, supported by Egypt, trying to reverse the transfer of power which had taken place the previous year. In fact, I think it was on this day, June the 27th. No, February 6th. No, but in 1995. Well, 1995. It was June the 27th. 27, I think, wasn't it? 17th. 17th. Okay, well, it was around this time of year. <laughs> so it was very much, you have a recurrence of the same four actors who, as Andreas have said, have never fully agreed with the Qatari perspective of trying to, to break out of the shadow of the overbearing Saudi embrace. And of course, the, one of the reasons why the leadership in Qatar in the 1990s tried to do that was because they had learned the lesson of the Kuwait invasion, of the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq in 1990, which is that you need to have external partnerships around the world to uh, overcome any potential vulnerability to your neighbors. And Qatar learned that lesson. They took that lesson, they absorbed it very clearly and began to use liquefied natural gas to create those uh, linkages around the world. So there's no threat perception that is um, consensual anymore in the GCC. As long as the Gulf states had a common external threat perception, which for many years was instability in Iraq, Iran, they could come together in moments of crisis. But over the last two years, that has been demolished by what has happened. It's going to be very difficult to recohere, especially now when the US is once again trying to rally its uh, partners against Iran, we've seen that, again, it's much more difficult to try and get them on the same page. So that's going to be a real consequence. And then just looking finally at some of the political implications for other states in the Gulf. Now, we, 
the GCC, as you said, is continuing. It's not dead. It's it's it still meets. They still have meetings of the summit every year. You still have committees meeting, and interestingly, the committees meeting take place in Kuwait and Oman much more than in Saudi Arabia. So they're even trying to find workarounds in sort of safe spaces. But if you're looking at this issue from a Kuwaiti or an Omani perspective, you recognize that at some point in the future, perhaps not so distant future, you will have a succession in Kuwait, you will have a succession in Oman. The Emir of Kuwait turned 90 last week, and Sultan Qaboosi turned 79 this year as well. It has not been lost on policymakers in other Gulf capitals that the pressure on Qatar began within three or four weeks of Emir Tamim coming to power in June 2013. The first signs of the pressure began to manifest in July that year. And then we had the rift beginning in March 2014, but you had the, the sort of showdown in Riyadh between King Abdullah and Emir Tamim in November of 2013, so within months. It has not been lost on other Gulf capitals that a young new leader, at the moment he's trying to consolidate his own domestic position and so is potentially vulnerable to external pressure, that that pressure was then applied. And in Kuwait and in Oman, there was, I think, a lot of concern, again, at neighboring states <coughs> trying to have a power play at a moment of political transition, which at least perhaps in Oman, perhaps also in Kuwait, will be less consensual than the one in Qatar. At least the one in Qatar was on their own terms. It was, uh, it was managed, it was choreographed. It, it wasn't um, through the death of a, a sitting ruler. And so, I mean, these are conditions and concerns that the Kuwaitis and the Omanis are very closely looking at towards Saudi Arabia and Kuwait's case to Oman, in, uh, towards the UAE in Oman's case. And so we see the longer term implications of what's happened over the last two years being applied to other potentially vulnerable flashpoints in the Gulf. And so it's very difficult to see how this ever recoheres in a way where you can rebuild trust, as you say. It's happened twice now in three years. The uh, Saudis and Emiratis would say, well, Qatar didn't respect the agreements in 2014. The Qataris would respond by, well, this has happened twice in three years. Why would we ever trust you again? And from a GCC point of view, the fact that the GCC twice now has failed to prevent three of its neighbors from t three of its members from turning on a fourth means when, what's the utility of belonging to an organization whose structures have been bypassed at every stage and the gcc was not the mechanism used to convey the grievances <coughs> of three of its members to a fourth the gcc was not used to try and mediate to try and find a common ground at every stage of this crisis the gcc has been absent in fact, I'm struggling to think of even one comment of the GCC on the crisis, on the secretariat level. I think he's been completely quiet. So this has difficulties going forward, especially when the future is going to be, as you say, a much more unpredictable, volatile gulf led by two leaders who have a track record of much, much greater assertiveness than, than their predecessors.